I'm speaking with a composer, Edwin Wendler, who has composed some fantastic work in films like the documentary The Right to Love, An American Family, and the thriller Escape. Uh, Edwin has also built uh, lasting collaborative relationships with big-name composers like Stephen Trask and John Ottman. Uh, he worked as an additional music arranger on Stephen's scores to Little Fockers and So Undercover. He worked as an additional music arranger on John Ottman's score for Unknown and also composed additional music on John's most recent score for the film Nonstop. But uh, thank you so much for uh, joining me today and, and talking. Thank you so much for having me, Kaya. So to start, I would love to know what music means to you uh, personally, and what made you pursue film composing? Well, music has always been part of my life. Uh, my mother and my father, they're both professional singers. Uh, my father made a career of it, and my mom uh, started singing, but she sort of burned out after a while. It got too stressful for her. But I always remember, like, there was always music playing when I grew up. Uh, mostly classical music mm -hmm. um, and so of course uh, I joined the Vienna Choir Boys uh, at age 10 for four tours um, and and that was sort of the the start of my professional musical career uh, because Vienna Choir Boys I mean you, you get exposed to so much classical music repertoire you learn so much in such a short amount of time it's really compressed um, and so but interestingly, most people who leave the Vienna Choir Boys don't really pursue a career path in music. Right. So I guess mine was a little unusual. <laughs> <laughs> but even while I was in the Vienna Choir Boys, I always loved listening to film music. Um, I remember like my earliest film music memories are some LPs that my dad bought. Um, his, his tastes in music are eclectic. It's mostly classical, but he really collects a lot of different kinds of music so and film music was just one portion of his large collection mm -hmm. which by the now is occupying two apartments <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I listened to those soundtracks and you know the usual like Star Wars ET right. um, and, and that's what got me started and so eventually I'd be like you know I, I would be really curious about what movies came out what composers wrote the music um, and so I started building my own collection um, so that's how it all started and I really always wanted to do film music like ever since I can remember about you know when people started asking me so what do you want to do later in life you know when you grow up and I always wanted to do film music so uh, the best way to do that is of course to come to LA you know LA has the best uh, educational facilities to study uh, film music and, and you just didn't have that in Austria so that's right. the reason why I came here so when when did you come over to the United States? Was it did you come directly just to LA? The whole sole purpose was to pursue film music. Yeah, that's right. I uh, I first came here. Well, the very first time I came here was actually with the Vienna Choir Boys on tour. That was in 1987, mm. and it's funny because I, I, I you know I ended up studying at UCLA UCLA Extension. Mm -hmm. But there is a photograph of me and the other Vienna Choir Boys in front of the Bruin statue at UCLA mm -hmm. from 1987. <laughs> <laughs> so it was the first time I was there. Wow. Um, and but, but I did come to LA, I think it must have been in 1994 or 95. Mm -hmm. um, just to to look at the place more uh, in more detail and to get to know people, to know the area. And I, had, I was really lucky because my uncle Carlos was living in L.A. at the time. Oh, he's now, he's wow. now in Miami, but at the time he was living here and he was so kind and nice and he, he got me all kinds of informational brochures from the different universities and he drove me all over town and he took me to his work. He was working for a TV station at the time. Um, it was just fascinating, and and I, I felt really welcomed by everybody. That's good. So it w for me, it was pretty much a no-brainer yeah. <laughs> to come here after after that <laughs> initial, uh, you know, trip that I just did for exploration purposes. Right, right. Yeah. So as a, as a storyteller, uh, what do you find to be the most engaging part of a film that kind of inspires your writing? Is it the plot, the characters, the setting, or maybe the editing or cinematography? I mean, I'm sure it's a combination of everything. But really, when you look at a script or you look at a finished film or at a spotting session, what really kind of jumps out at you first and goes, you know, sparks that first idea in your head? Mm -hmm. Well, obviously, it's, uh, it's a combination. But I would say 
it's it's the emotions. I mean, music mm -hmm. is expresses emotion like very few other things can. So it's you know you basically you watch a scene or you watch the whole movie and you try to get a macro picture like what is the overall tone of the movie right um and that's usually what what needs the most work in the initial stages um and that's also something that gets fine tuned as you know through the whole process you know right, through right. editing through reshoots through ADR you know through very detailed things sometimes um, that you need to be very clear about what the tone is, um, and so in, in at the same time that you know the the movie takes shape, the music also takes shape. You you start to um, you know find your musical palette, your your themes if there are any. Right. And um, yeah, but usually what grabs me is is some sort of gut reaction, some sort of emotion that I feel. Uh, or something that I think can be heightened emotionally, mm -hmm. something that the filmmaker really wanted to do here, but it, it, it might not be as clear as it could be. And I usually get that sense when meeting with the filmmakers when, when they say, you know, yeah, you know, I wish like we could have done this or that. And, and I, I always try to help, um, you know, get the film to where it needs to be, where the filmmaker wanted it to be from the beginning. Right, right. And I think that relationship, the director-composer relationship, is a very uh, essential one. So from your experience, you know, because I'm not a composer, I'd rather, I'm coming from like the directing and writing aspect of it. So for you, from your experience, um, what qualities make a good director, you know, from a composer's point of view? What do you look for in a director that really helps you with your process? Well, as a composer, obviously, you want to be supportive. You want to be the director's best friend. Mm -hmm. You you want to be sitting there in the trenches with the director and and help uh, bring his vision to reality. And right. um, and and different directors have different styles of doing that. Um, there's one director that I've worked with a few times, um, who who just basically lets me do my thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he gives me picture. He sometimes will say, you know, oh, I hate the temp music here, you know, do something else. But then I just basically get to score the whole movie and then he comes in and he usually has two or three notes um, about certain scenes that don't really work for him. Mm -hmm. And and I, you know, in almost all cases, I, I can immediately sense what he, what what's bothering him. And it's usually due to some sort of misunderstanding or, or some wrong tangent that I went off on. Um, so I'm, I'm glad to get that guidance from the director. Um, and then that's it. You know, I, I do, I rework some cues, he listens, he's happy and that's it. There are other directors who, who are much more detail oriented, mm -hmm. um, where it's down to like, you know, hope oh, can you change these seven seconds of music and, and, you know, can you change them like 15 times until I find something <laughs> that works? Um, but you know, no matter what the approach is, I'm always happy to go along with it. Uh, as long as there's logistically enough time to do it, right. you know. Occasionally, as a composer, you have to say, you know, I, I would really be happy to do, you know, thirty versions of every cue. We just don't have the time. Right. And usually, usually they understand, and you just do the best you can. Um, but you know, no matter what the directing style is, I'm always happy to adapt. That's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you uh, recently, you know, John Ottman has a score coming out nonstop, which you uh, did additional music for. Um, mm -hmm. So you've been part of John Ottman's team on several of his scores. Uh, so has being an additional composer and an arranger, has that helped you kind of shaped your uh, work ethic in any way? Like personally, has John given you any words of wisdom about the business? Well, John is a very wise person to begin with, but he, he doesn't show it. You know, he doesn't, uh, he, he's, he's very funny, he's very kind, he's very open. Mm -hmm. Um and and he's just fun to talk to um so so he will never like uh you know pretend to be any sort of professorial figure or anything <laughs> you know it's it's always uh wrapped up in some sort of joke or something that will make <laughs> you smile right um but uh i i think the the, the, the lessons that I learned from John and especially from Paul Haslinger right um, because that that's how I started uh, doing arranging um, is that you know you just hang out with these people and you see uh, what they do in certain situations um, like in in Paul's case I was just sitting there in the studio and I was 
you know, I was talking to him and we got interrupted by a phone call. And it, it's really interesting to see, to witness how a professional composer who has done lots of movies is dealing with certain problems um, and, and how he's dealing with clients and so forth. Right. Um, a very interesting scenario, for instance, is like the, the show and tell sessions. You know, when, when the composer has to present the music to one or two people and sometimes even like 15 people, you know, oh, yeah. like you have this whole room full of people and I'm just sitting there thinking, wow, you know, how can, how will Paul handle this situation? You know, there's like 15 people sitting behind him <laughs> and some of them are distracted. Some of them are on their cell phones. Some of them are checking email, you know, how is he handling that situation? And it, that, that aspect to me was the most interesting. And that's and that stuff you can't really be taught. You really do have to kind of experience that. Yeah, you, you can't you can't really teach that in school. I guess what you can do is you can recreate mm -hmm. a situation like that, like uh, you know, in sort of a playful mock scenario mm -hmm. type of environment. And one of my teachers did that. Gerald Fried did that. Oh wow! Um, at UCLA Extension, he did uh, like mock interviews, like where where Jerry pretended to be. A producer or director or something mm -hmm. and you would come in as an as a composer interviewing to get a movie and and he would do things like it was really funny sometimes like <laughs> he he would instead of talking about the movie he would start talking about his kids mm -hmm. it's like you know oh I love my kids you know and, and one of them just graduated I was so proud of her and do you have kids and you know so it's <laughs> you know as a composer then you have to you know be polite about it but you still want to stay focused right. and you, you know you want to remember the reason why you're sitting there you know you're not just talking small talk you <laughs> you, you, you want to write music for a movie right or he did things like he would constantly get interrupted by phone calls or some imaginary assistant would come in and interrupt all the time <laughs> that's cool you know, how how are you dealing with situations like that and yeah. and Jerry Fried really you know, because obviously, out of experience, he really wanted us to to be prepared for that sort of scenario, and that was really, really helpful. Yeah, I can. Uh, that's a really cool thing. That's awesome. Um, yeah. But so, moving to some of your your works, uh, your scores, Escape is uh, probably one of my favorite scores of yours, and it's a terrific piece of work. And the CD album is uh, a terrific too. Everyone should definitely grab that. Um, Thank you so much. That means a lot. But so, what were your goals musically for Escape? Uh, how did the you know it takes place on this kind of uh, tropical setting? Did that play into how you formed your soundscape and everything? Yeah, it, it definitely did. Escape was one of those lucky. Uh, scenarios where I went in and there was temp music that everybody universally hated <laughs> and that to me is is the most fun that the best type of situation because uh, you're you know, free <laughs> exactly and no matter what you do it's gonna be better than the temp most right. likely unless you really screw up <laughs> so um, but also you know it it's it, it it gives you a lot of freedom as you said right, uh, right. And in this case obviously the uh, the location was a big inspiration, and, and I looked uh, into music from Thailand, traditional Thai music, um, and you know I, I picked certain samples that I could use and that I could pitch tune. But basically, what I wanted to do is I wanted to do, an, uh, you know, especially during the su suspense moments of the movie, mm -hmm. just do something percussive, um, because at that time I. I couldn't find many examples where that had been done before. Yeah, and I, I I usually want to do unusual stuff whenever the directors and producers allow me to do so. Um, like one thing I still want to do is to do a whole score with a choir, mm -hmm. um, where where the choirs are doing you know not just the expected thing but something that's more orchestral in nature and you have sections of the choir do different things or even sound effect type of stuff you know scary noises and whispering and that sort of thing mm -hmm. um, but in, in this case I, I really wanted to do something percussive um, which was very very different from the temp it was mostly temped with uh, Morricone's The Mission which is a brilliant brilliant wonderful score um, but in, in placed in this movie um, it was sometimes too pretty and and didn't emphasize the suspense elements. Oh, yeah, it's not a suspenseful um, score at all. <laughs> yeah, so I wanted to get as far away from that as I could, um, because even though everybody loved the music 
per se, they they didn't like it in the context right. of, of the movie. It just felt wrong in, in many different places. So I thought that the solution to that would be a percussion-driven score. And it's not like there's no melodies in it. There's there's strong, pretty strong melody in it. Um, but especially during moments of suspense, I felt that the percussion should take over. And that seemed to kind of work. Mm -hmm. and, and and the filmmakers responded very positively. It definitely worked, yeah. I love the I Thank love you. the fact that it was a very percussive score and it, it was it just it grabs you, it grabs hold of you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um you also scored uh, The Right to Love an American Family, which I think was the first score that I ever heard of your of yours. Um I remember I, I think I reviewed it actually on on the site and um this was a few years ago, but I think the topic of gay rights is very topical now, uh, especially with the Winter Olympics in Russia. That kind of brought yeah. everything to the forefront. So, when you're working on a documentary that deals with you know real life topics like that, does the process uh, carry any more weight than something fictional like Escape? Do you feel like you're doing uh, something more, I guess, substantial? Definitely, I would say that that score was for me the most emotional ride I ever had as a composer mm -hmm. and and it, you know as like as fantastical as some of the projects are that you're working on the emotions always have to feel real mm -hmm. but in this case you're dealing with actual reality and right. and and recent history mm -hmm. so it was very surreal for me to be working on this documentary and I saw some news footage that they had used that I remembered seeing as it was first broadcast. Um, so I, I remembered those emotions, those those visceral reactions that I had to the events of the time. Mm -hmm. And so that's why it was so emotional for me, you know, the unfairness of it. And the, you know, you see all these happy people, they just want to get married. Right. And government tells them, no, you can't. Mm -hmm. Or voters tell them, no, you can't. I mean, how how awful is that feeling you know you're surrounded by all these people and 51 percent of them tell you you're not allowed to marry you know that that's that's a really depressing <laughs> situation it's terrible. yeah it's terrible um <laughs> so uh, it, it was very emotional and and i hope that some of that came through in the music there's this very um fine line that you have to walk in terms of tone you know you can't be right. too emotional mm -hmm. And too manipulative. On the other hand, if you, if you go too cold, it it doesn't grab people. Yeah, it becomes attached. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I you know with every cue I, I try to walk that very fine line and and but I think for the most part I, I got it. You know at least the director was very happy with it. We made some adjustments, but you know there there were really some cues that I I felt that might be too emotional, mm -hmm. especially because the temp music wasn't as emotional as my music was, but I submitted those tracks and I was really nervous about them and, and then I got a phone call back from the director and she's like, you know, I just watched it with my co-producers and we're all in tears <laughs> and this is wonderful stuff. So I I, I was really happy That's with that project. That's the best news a composer can get, I guess. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but to, to wrap up, I always love to ask composers uh, this one question. If you could score any film ever made with no disrespect to the original composer or the original score, which film would you choose? I love the question, by the way. I've listened to several of your interviews, <laughs> and, and composers usually react by saying, oh, that's an interesting question. Let me think about it. For right, a yeah. So I, I am prepared. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my, good. Ans my answer is uh, The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King. Wow, that's a good because, one. Because my favorite genre is fantasy, you mm -hmm. know, fantasy, sci-fi, um, and and that's arguably the best fantasy movie out there. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's it obviously got all those Academy Awards, eleven, I think, mm -hmm. and uh, it's it's got high stakes, amazing visual effects. Uh, you know, just a huge canvas to paint on. Several moments where the music can just soar and speak without sound effects or dialogue. Right. Uh, you have amazing performances. It's you have. You have phenomenal displays of courage and friendship, and, mm -hmm. and there's even a love story in it. I mean, what composer would not love to work in a movie Absolutely, like that? Absolutely, yeah. 
No, that's a great answer. I don't think, it, I mean, it seems like an obvious choice. A lot of people have heard say Star Wars. I don't think anyone has said Lord of the Rings, actually, so <laughs> awesome choice. Um, but Edwin, thank you so much for your time and for talking today. It was such a great pleasure and an honor, and it's so informative and fun, so thank you so much. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Kaya.